age of 73. Okay. <laughs> Excellent. Such as it goes. Um, Tony, we're doing a um, campaign about hidden disabilities. Can you tell mm. us um, what condition you have? Um, I've got three, actually. The first one that was diagnosed was uh, cervical myopathy, which is uh, joint in the neck. In my case, it's between uh, C4 and C7. The three joints are fused together and also trapped nerves. So that's what gives me chronic pain and it affects literally the top half of my body. Um, and about two years after that started, I was told I actually also had fibromyalgia, um, which again, that actually causes all sorts of pain in the muscles, in the nerves, uh, which affects the whole body. So it can come on very suddenly, and it can change from getting up in the morning, going in the shower, and fine, and the moment you come out of the shower, you feel like you've been, you've worked about 15 hours and you're absolutely useless. You know, you have to lie down and I just lie down for an hour or so and then get up and carry on and do a bit more and go that way. But uh, eventually from that, I also got uh, osteoarthritis, which all seemed to come from the initial cervical myopathy, which caused pain right down into the right wrist. And now the right wrist is what was diagnosed with arthritis. So there's no, no cure for it. I have to live with it. So I live with painkillers. And that's it. How else does it um, impact your life? Tell us a little bit about um, what your life involves and how the condition sometimes either restricts that or limits it. It restricts it quite a bit, actually. I mean, I, I socialise very little. I used to socialise quite a lot, I used to be quite athletic, um, but from the age of 58, which is when this occasion happened, and in fact it was on the 18th of January 2001, um, my social side of life is really severely curtailed, uh, because you can't guarantee how you're going to feel. Um, as far as evenings go, then I, I just write them off because I can be totally exhausted by 8 o'clock in the evening, or even before. So, uh, you know, you just um, take life as it comes, really, and you live with what you've got and you carry on. But there's, uh, there's not much else you can, one can do about it. Um, you can't exercise too much, because if you start doing any form of exercise, you find that it, it affects your joints, it affects your muscles and pain. Uh, so therefore, you give it up. It, uh, it's hard to it's hard to really explain it, but um, no, it just doesn't work. And at the same time, what well, worked when I was working was uh, very understanding. Really, um, they used to uh, keep a, a fold-up bed for me in one of our, our boardrooms, and whenever I wanted, I used to go off in that room, shut the door and open the bed up and I'd lay down for an hour, uh, which would help me. But I found that um, I went from working 12 hour days to about six, and then it even reduced down to less. Mm -hmm. And at one time I, I had to stop altogether. Uh, but then I got so annoyed that I couldn't do work that it got me more upset and more stressed out that uh, I, approached the state and the doctors and said, look, I've got to go back. So it was a, it was a catch-22 and I played with it as it was and you know, did what, what one could. It sounds like your work was very understanding, which is great. So, um, they were, they yeah. were. I mean, uh, as I say, it started in January 2001, but I actually stopped work in um, April of 2005 because I just couldn't carry on any further. And in fact, at the time when my doctor stopped me working, he told me he was amazed that I lasted that long. He only expected me to last about 18 months. So, um, being a typical Guernsey man, I'm a bit obstinate. <laughs> and, and I enjoyed my work. I enjoyed the job. I th you know, I'd done it 30 odd years, so uh, that was it. Great. So the key for you is you wanted to work. That gives you obviously the inclusion and... and um, reduce your stress in many ways from what you were saying. Oh, yeah. But really, um, the, 
flexibility is required, uh, you know, around that to be able to work. Oh, that's a yeah. You, you, it's, without the flexibility, you you would just get so stressed out, mm -hmm. which would aggravate the pain and everything else. So uh, to have a good employer is a, is a major factor. Was everybody at your company understanding or in the community? Could you tell us a little bit about having a hidden disability that's unseen? What were some of the responses that you would receive? Oh God, when, when, when I was having a really bad day, I've known to literally stand with my hands against the wall and literally hitting the, the wall with my head because the pain was so bad. Um, but people used to just ignore it and they just let me carry on and do my thing and that was a good side mm -hmm. because you know you feel so you're so embarrassed at the time of what's happening and yet there's nothing you can do about it and the more people can just let you carry on and do it your way then the better you feel you, know what I mean? you didn't feel judgment no no, I didn't. Uh, you know, I, I just, I knew I was doing the best I could. And as long as they allowed me to carry on, then um, that was fine. And fortunately, as I say, they, uh, they were quite happy. I was middle management at the time, so it, I suppose it helped. <laughs> Brilliant. Oh, that's great. It's great to hear that about work. That's good for us to have some footage that isn't mm. sort of negative, mm. which is great. Yeah. Can you tell us a little bit more about the community or friends or family and, and how they would understand something that can't be seen? Well, as I say, the social side was curtailed quite a bit. Um, as far as my family is concerned, yeah, obviously they were very concerned for me. They could see what I was going through. and. Um, but at the same time, they also knew there was nothing they could do about it. So um, I was quite happy just to be accepted to left to do what I, I, I could. And that way I was quite happy. But you do feel pretty inadequate at times, you know. And, um, well, you don't talk about it so much because uh, nobody really wants to know how bad you are because nobody wants to talk about it. So you ignore it, basically. Mm -hmm. And I just got on the understanding that every day is a new day, and I start a fresh day every morning. And sometimes it's like last night, I didn't sleep at all. So uh, I've slept about one hour since the night before last. But it's normal. Could you tell us a bit more about um, what's involved? We talked about quiet pain, but now you're talking about sleep as well. Could you, if you didn't mind, maybe sort of give us a list of, you know, I'm just thinking for, we're going to cut a lot of this. Yeah, sure. What we try sure. to have little um, snippets. So, um, fibromyalgia for you, what, what um, does the condition? Fibromyalgia in itself for me is uh, the pain. Um, you can get the pain in the muscles as well as nerve pain. Uh, in most of the joints of the body, um, and when you when it is pretty bad, there's nothing I can do except lie down. And I've sort of con been able to condition myself that when the pain is bad, I literally lie on a bed and I shut down. And usually, I can lay on the bed for about an hour, and it sort of recharges me and it enables me to get on and do a little bit more. But um, that's all you can do. You can actually do a bit, and then rest, and then carry on and try and do a bit more. And you, you do it that way. I mean, I look after my wife at home. Um, so therefore, you know, I've got to think of her more than I think about myself. <laughs> you know, she, she, she certainly needs me. No, I don't think it gets much closer than that. Oh. So some people talked about, um, you know, the pain, but also the sleep and other things. Mm. For you, is it mostly the pain? Like, um, not... Um, let me just go back to my notes, sorry. Mm. I think we had chronic fatigue, irritable bowel, bladder, muscle mm. pain, vertigo, sleep issues, you know, like... Yeah. For yourself, is it mostly the pain? It's... It's, it's pain, it's um, 
the whole emphasis is you can feel absolutely drained uh, within you can change within a matter of half an hour from from feeling fine uh, in one respect to the next minute to be in pain or just um, joint problems um, yeah hot flushes a terrible hot flushes <laughs> I always thought women had that but I mean I found otherwise <laughs> um, but no it's I've got so used to it now to be quite honest it, it's you just take it as it is. Yeah. One of the things about this campaign is asking the public to be a bit more aware or, or, or to change attitudes. Would you have any tips? To be quite honest, in my condition as such, um, I couldn't recommend on how to treat it because I know how I react to it. But to whether, um, I mean, my one of my nephews has actually got the same condition uh, at fibro. And he's found, he manages it by, he's changed his complete diet. And he can do it, and he, and he does a lot of exercise. And for him it works, which is great. Um, but although my diet is, it, I keep pretty strict on, but the exercise, no, I can't do that. Um, certainly with the, the arthritis as well, that's kicked in. So that cuts that out for me. Okay. Um, but no, I, I, I find a, a rest to recharge the batteries and then get back on and do things and, and not give up. And that's the way I do it. Good attitude. Oh. Uh, talking about your nephew, um, presumably it's quite new to him. Um, anything, any tips you'd either have for him or tips for people interacting to understand the condition more? It's, it, when it's, it can be hard for people to understand what you've got because the simple reason people look at you and there's nothing wrong with you as far as they're concerned. You know? Um, how, do you tell, how do you get people to understand that you, you feel absolutely lethargic and painful and aching muscles? Uh, you, it doesn't show. And yet... I don't know, how, do you, how can you get people to understand that? It's, it's a very difficult thing. Um, most people with our condition tend to shut away. And to say, like me, I'll go and lie on the bed and recharge myself that way to be able to carry on and do things. And you just make do. Thank you, that was a good little summary, yeah. wasn't it? Uh, that's great, thank mm. you. Sorry, we're talking to it, and sometimes no, it no, sounds like right. I'm asking the same question, but I'm trying to do, make it short yeah. and distinct, so that's great. Um, anything else that you want to share? Anything about the, the GPs, or like what would help? The GP, like, well, my, my, my GPs, I must admit, I've, with this condition, I've gone through uh, three, four GPs. Uh, they keep retiring on me. <laughs> <laughs> After 15 years, they don't last very long. <laughs> do they uh, understand the condition? Yeah, yeah, they do. I must, I, I've been most fortunate. Um, the first doctor was uh, Tony O'Donnell, mm -hmm. who, uh, who was very good. And then it was Malcolm Chamberlain and Bruce Mackay. And now I'm with Nick King. Um, Nick's been, I've been with him now for the last... Well, nearly two and a half years, mm -hmm. but unfortunately he was off ill for a, yes. a period, so um, we're only really getting on a, a knowledgeable basis. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, he only found out last month, I think it was last month, or the month before, that I had the uh, fibro, uh, the cervical myopathy. Okay. Yep. Uh, and then when he found out I had it, he said, oh yeah, well, what operation did you have? And I said, I didn't have one. Okay. It was actually done at work okay. that it came about. Yeah. Um, How did diagnosis happen for you? Um, well, when, when the accident happened, it was purely, I, I was sitting down at my desk and I reached up into a cupboard to pull out a lever arch file. And uh, it was quite a heavy one. And as I pulled it out, somebody put it on a higher shelf than it should have been. The weight of it caused me to drop it and pain shot all the way up my arm. I thought, eh, stupid idiot, you know, shake it as you do. Um, after about half an hour, I went to 
uh, lift something, and the same pain shot again. And with that, I ended up going to the hospital. And they initially looked at it and said, uh, oh, he said, you've, you've got a trapped nerve. And oh well, take some anti-inflammatories and uh, go and see your doctor. This was on a Friday, and he said, go and see the doctor on Monday, because you won't get into a surgery now. And by then, uh, it went round, and then uh, they said, oh, uh, right, we'll do more. Have a, have a triptyline, gabapentin, and uh, then that was in the January. In the April, I actually flew to London and had an MRI scan. Um, I followed up by, I uh, so had a consultation with a consultant neurosurgeon in, in, in Winchester. And that was when I found out that I had problems with neck joints. And uh, it was a case of wait, it could cure itself in 12 months, or they'd have to look at it further and see how serious it was gone. Um, in my case, I went back to, had another scan a year later, and I saw a different neurosurgeon, and that's when I found out that, uh, yeah, I had problems. Uh, to the point where it was up to me to decide whether I had an operation, but he told me what the options were on that operation, and it was a case of a 30% chance that I'd get some improvement, a 30% chance I'd get no improvement, and a 30% chance that I would be, remain the same, mm -hmm. and a 10% chance I wouldn't wake up. Okay. Um, and I said, thank you very much, I won't go any further. Because I'd rather put up with the pain and suffer that way than take those sort of chances on the table. There's lots of tests, right? There's no one test for fibromyalgia? No, well, I say mine at the time on that on that condition was the cervical myopathy. Um, but then it was after that when I suddenly found that the pain, instead of it being just in the, the head and the neck and the arms, um, ended up by being in all the other joints on my body. And I th thought it was just referred pain, as it was mentioned to me at one point. Um, and it... Malcolm was, unbeknown to me, trying all these different things and checkups, and that's when he turned around after about a 12 month and said, you've got fibromyalgia as well. And mm -hmm. so no scans for that, um, blood tests or...? Oh yeah, I've had blood tests and that, all that sort of thing. You know, I've, I've literally gone through the mill on what they... But there's, there's no cure for fibro. And unfortunately with me, I've, I've got three things and there's no cure for any of them. So that's why I've, got, I've, I've literally set my mind that you take it as things go. You know, it's my bad luck. That's, that's what I've got, so I've got to live with it. Um, I'll take a death and shoot it. <laughs> yeah, really. nothing, uh, nothing else one can do, you know, if they can't cure you. I know one of the doctors turned around me at one time and he said, uh, I bet you feel that the medical profession has you know, dealt you a raw deal and haven't done very well by you. And I said, no. You know, I said, I know, the doc I know this doctor very well. And I said, you know, if you could have done something, you would have done it. Right. That's good to hear confidence, because normally it's the other way around. So yeah, no, he, he, was, he was the one that instituted me going to London yeah. uh, as a private patient and also on to Winchester. So, um, yeah, I had no problems in, in the, the treatment I received. It was just unfortunate they couldn't do it down all for me. Brilliant. Can I just say your name first? Okay, I'm Sam. Do you want me to say your name as well? Yeah, maybe if you say um, your name and um, I have fibromyalgia and then just tell us a little bit about what it is and what it means to you. Like, you know we gave them quite a big list, don't we, didn't we? Yeah. About all of things. Um, if you could, yeah, just say that and I'll try and get all of that in one, one cup. Okay. So. Right, my name's Sam Sindel. I've got fibromyalgia um, as well as a list of other things. Um, I've had it since I was four, so I don't know what life is like without pain. Um, it's, it can be depressing, um, tiring, very painful. Um, yeah, so some days you wish you had, I mean, it's, you wish you had cancer, because at least then if you're going to die, you've got a light at the end of the tunnel. But with fibromyalgia, it's just torture 
So you've got torture all your life and you can't see an ending. So it can be very depressing. That's very really mm. Gosh, I think that's a really important point. I look like something a bit shorter, so if you, may, if you say that Sam, I would imagine, and then the, the, you know, the pain um, yeah. part, and just that um, it's a lifelong condition that is really hard to... Yeah. Know, yeah. Um, Charles, do you my yeah, name again? Okay, my name's Sam Sindel. I have uh, fibromyalgia. Um, I've had it all my life, and it's a very painful, very depressing um, illness. Um, Tell me about um, what, what it's like for you every day, Sam. Like, what are the things that are, are difficult for you living with a um, disability? Some days I wake up paralysed. Um, I've got no legs and it can take, uh, say, three hours up to two days for my legs to come back. So I'm always panicking that that's it, I'm going to be paralysed. Um, I fall over a lot because of the vertigo that comes with fibromyalgia. Um, yeah, I, I fall at least three times a week. So I've got all my, my markings. And I always seem to land on my face. So quite painful. So there's quite a lot of conditions with fibromyalgia. Mm. You mentioned the pain, yeah. like fatigue. Yeah. Should I, do you want me to go list of everything that I suffer with? Not, not the conditions, maybe with fibromyalgia and there's a range of things, you know, that you also yeah. have that. I don't know, you know, people were talking about, um, you just mentioned the spiritual Vertigo, vertigo yeah. Vertigo, well, you know, chronic fatigue. Yeah. So, um, with the condition of fibromyalgia, I also suffer with insomnia, um, vertigo, um, um, anxiety, which I'm suffering a little bit now. Um, you worry a lot all the time, I suppose that's part of the anxiety. You also suffer a lot with depression. Um, you feel isolated very isolated because people don't understand the illness. So. Talk about the pain, is it in your legs or is it in all um, muscles? My pain is all over my body. Um, there's not one part of my body that doesn't hurt at any one time. Um, I can wake up one day and my back is in absolute agony and I've got pain in my legs but not as much. We range the pain from zero to no pain at all, up to 10, which is, I'm in agony, please shoot me. And then um, mine is at a five or six permanently. And when it gets above a nine, that's when I pass out or can't cope anymore. So I go from a walking stick when I'm on a five. I go, when I get to an eight, I got my Zimmer frame with three wheels. And then when it's at a nine, I'm in the wheelchair. So this is how I change all the time. You mentioned earlier that that's quite hard for the public to understand. It is, yeah. Um, when I've gone out with my walking stick and people have seen me with my stick, they don't make any comments or anything, but next time they see me, if I'm in the wheelchair, it's like, hang on a minute, you were walking the other day, why are you in a wheelchair now? And I just say to them, you know, I could be on the Zimmer frame tomorrow, or I could be on back on the walking stick. Or It depends, really, on how you are when you wake up. But people can be very judgmental. They tend to judge first and don't actually ask questions. If they asked more, then they might understand it more. So you're happy for people to ask questions? Oh, I'm more than happy. You know, people come up to I've had people come up to me in the street and said to me, oh, we've seen you on the fibromyalgia website. And they asked me about the illness. I've, been, I've gone to the pub before on a hen night and I've had two women come up to me wanting to talk about fibromyalgia. Which is perfectly fine. I've got no problem at all. Quite a large support group, though, please. It is, yes. It's a very, very friendly support group. We're very approachable, <laughs> even though maybe not the. <laughs> but <laughs> yeah, um, we're not a scary group. Um, we're not a, a group that you come in sort of to wear and depress about what you've got. Um, we're more for thinking about what you can do rather than what you can't. And we're a very happy group, so you come round and you can be yourself. If you start slurring your words or anything because of the fibro fog, we don't judge. 
So you've got no problems at all in being yourself. You don't have to put the face on and pretend that you're fine. So that's one good thing. Yeah. I'm going to say something quite controversial mm. because I think it gets out in Twitter and stuff when it is. Would you be, would it be fair, I'll put words in your mouth, but um, would, I'm looking for a little strap line, so with brain injury it was like drunk, yeah. you know I have. Do you think people think you're a fraud if you said fraud, no, um, my pain means one day I'm with a walking stick another day I'm in a wheelchair? Yeah. Is that too harsh? Is no. That, do you think that's going to be too full on? Or what other work can we use? I've actually had what people. Feel comfortable with? I've had people phone up supplementary, and grass me up. Yeah. Because um, wheelchair one day, obviously disabled. Yeah. Next day I'm walking with a stick, so they think, hang on a minute, there's something not right here. And they've actually phoned up supplementary saying if she's cla if she's claiming disability, she's not disabled. Okay. So I've had quite a few people do that, thinking that I'm defrauding the states. What would be the word that you find upsetting? Like, you know, when people, like, for, for Daniel, it was drunk. What, what would be the word for you that's upsetting? Um, I've been referred to as an alcoholic, but I'm teetotal. Um, and that's the um, fibro fog? That's when you get really foggy, um, you walk all over the place, you lose your balance, you fall over, you slur your words. And then when the anxiety kicks in, you look like you're paralytic, you know, you're slow, you can barely speak, you can't get eye contact, um, so you fall over a lot. And you basically look like you're drunk, so people all, you know, there's a few people that think I'm an alcoholic, but I've been teetotal for about eight years, so I don't drink. <laughs> and um, I've gone driving from a manual to an automatic, because I find I can drive both, but on a bad day, um, my sciatic nerve gets triggered and I can't use my left leg. So on a bad day, I drive my, my automatic and I'm perfectly fine. Let's not put that in just in case transport decides yeah. to take the license well, away. We'll get on that bit. I've actually, I've actually gone up to the motor tax place and explained it to them and I put it all in writing and everything. And they said, you passed in a manual, you can keep that license, but we trust you to know what you can and can't drive on certain days. So that was good. So some days I wake up and I'm like, I'm not driving at all today because I don't trust myself. Good. So, so yeah. Responsibility yeah. Condition. Yeah. Um, other tips to the public to help understand, or what would you mm. ask? What would you ask of the public? Ask questions. If they don't understand, ask. Mm -hmm. um, don't be quick to judge. Um, we are human. We are approachable. Um, we honestly do not mind if people stop us in the street and ask us, what are you suffering with? You know, rather than make judgments. So, yeah. Okay, my name's Jo Borghese. I'm the coordinator of the Guernsey... <laughs> Can't do it. I'm the coordinator of the Guernsey Fibromyalgia Support Group. Uh, the, the group was set up in 2007 um, and lots of members come on a regular monthly basis. What about yourself, Joe? Do you have fibromyalgia yourself? Yes, I have fibromyalgia. Um, I was diagnosed just before I set up the support group. Um, I didn't know anybody else that had the condition and I thought, well, I need to know how this condition is going to affect me. I think one of the questions I asked the specialist that diagnosed me was, well, okay, you've told me what I've got, but does that mean I'm going to live a shorter life? How is it going to affect me? How is it going to affect my young family? Um, and I went home and did lots of research, and I thought, oh, right, okay, it's complex. <laughs> um, with that, you know, how am I going to live my life? And I think in order to cope with the condition, I did have to make some life changes. And how I talk to other people that have the condition now is that when I'm trying to explain it to them, is I often say, well, it's not life-threatening, but it is life-changing. That doesn't mean you can't learn to cope with it, and that doesn't mean you're going to have a lesser life because of it. 
So I think it's about trying to find ways that work for you because everybody that has a condition, they have it in different variations, different forms, different degrees. Um, and me personally, I find there's some months where I cope quite well and I try to forget I have the condition because I want to be normal. I don't want to have a disability. I never ask for it. Um, and there are other months where I struggle. And when I struggle, I rely heavily on those that care about me, my husband, my family. And it's important that they understand because if they don't understand, they can't begin to help me. Understanding yes, to understand is to know what the symptoms are and how it affects me. So sometimes when I'm talking, I'll forget things. I'll forget somebody's name, I'll forget what I was about to say, and not taking, making fun of me, um, and just allowing me time to try to find what I was going to say. I think in the early days, people used to, to joke and say, oh, mum's forgotten again. And then they've learned that actually I'm not putting it on. Um, I haven't actually got dementia. I have a problem with my um, cognitive function because fibromyalgia can affect your cognitive functioning. Um, and trying to make me not feel silly. Um, you know, I'm still young. I want to, I want to be uh, as clever as I was before. <laughs> um, but sometimes it, I do struggle. Um, and so they try to support me in that. And if we get invited out, and I can't always give an answer as if I can go or not, and a good friend will keep asking you, invite you out again. Um, and those that understand will say, well, okay, Joe can't make it this week, but we'll ask her next time we're going out, and maybe she'll come then. Because they know that this condition hasn't changed the person I am. I'm still a fun-loving person. I enjoy having a good time, I enjoy spending time with friends, but sometimes I'm just not up to it. And if I dragged myself there, I feel I would probably ruin it for those others that are there because I wouldn't be able to keep up with them. But the biggest thing is you pay for it in two or three days later when you're at home and you can't get out of bed and you're really tired and you're hurting. And to me, I have to balance that. I have to weigh up what is the best thing to do. So I tend to look at my week and think, right, I've got a commitment there. I've, I've said I'm going to do that. In order to do that, I need to make sure the day before is not too stressful, that I haven't packed too much into my diary uh, in order to cope with it. And that seems to work for me. Uh, it's not necessarily how I want it to be, but it works. Um, it works for our family. It works for me. You have a great attitude towards it, but we've heard from the others it's very complex. You've talked about the fatigue, you've talked about um, possibly some tons of functioning. Um, there's quite a lot of other um, symptoms around fibromyalgia. Could you explain some of those? Yes. Yeah. It's, well, it's, it's known as a chronic pain and fatigue syndrome. And the pain is, uh, um, it can be varying, it can, even for myself. Sometimes it will be a dull ache, sometimes it will be a stabbing pain, and usually I, you, I get it in the muscles and the joints. Um, and sometimes it's painful to walk. And the fatigue can be quite extreme to feeling like, uh, a lot of people explain it as like you've had the plug pulled out. So it's like a flu-like symptom that just doesn't go with rest. Normally with flu, you rest for a few days, you take plenty of water, fluids, and you feel better when the flu has taken its course. But with um, fibromyalgia, it doesn't seem to ease. So the flu, fogginess, headaches just carry on. And it, it tends to be, they call it, um, when you're having a, fl a fibromyalgia flare-up, so the symptom can have, it goes in peaks and troughs. And um, when I'm coping well, it's on its sort of plateau. And then when you have a peak, that's when you're having a fibro flare up. And why you get them, it's not really known, but normally it's because you haven't paced yourself particularly well 
and you've had a lot of events, even with the best will in the world, world of trying to pace yourself, we all know that things happen in life and you can't prevent them. So there'll be stresses, there'll be things happening with your family, work, whatever, and you can't stop those, so you have to learn to deal with those. But when you have a condition like fibromyalgia, something like that is enough to trigger a flare-up. And you have to just let it take its course, really. And how I personally deal with it is I try to rest. So for me, I take myself to bed, and as soon as my head hits the pillow, I'm asleep. So it normally means I'm very tired. Uh, and a lot of my friends joke and say, how can she possibly take herself to bed in the afternoon? It's a sunny day. But to me, that's the most important thing I need to do. It's my body saying, I need to rest. And after I've rested for a few hours, I get up and I feel a lot better. I feel able to cope with the rest of the day. Thank you. You've talked about how important friendships are, relationships. One of the keys of this hidden disability campaign is to help the public understand what they can do differently. And you've given us a few tips. Could you maybe give us a couple more about what you'd ask the public or the community? Yeah. Um, well, a lot of people that come to the support group, one of the biggest things they say to me is that they feel frustrated. They feel like people don't understand them. So I try to encourage them to bring along a partner, a friend, um, somebody to support them through the process and in bringing somebody along it means that other person gets to know about the condition because it is complex in terms of the different symptoms it could be it could be pain it could be fatigue both of them together it could be that they're having trouble with sleep it could be they're having uh, irritable bowel syndrome um, irritable bladder there's lots of other parts of the condition that make up this complex condition um, and now I've forgotten what we were saying. <laughs> okay. <laughs> that was really good because I was going to ask you to yes. list um, some of the others. Uh, 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 what would like the um, public, the community, oh, to yeah. do differently? Okay. Um, I think really to not to judge people, to actually, when you ask somebody how they are, listen for the answer. Don't just say, make it a. It's almost like it's a greeting. How are you today? And then you walk away. Because sometimes people with fibromyalgia, they just think, oh, I'm not going to go into it. I'm not going to explain that I'm having a bad day because they're not going to want to hear that. So quite often, if you ask somebody with a condition like fibromyalgia, they'll say, oh, okay. But if you're a true friend, I think you'd say, but no, really, how are you feeling today? Are you having a good day? How's this week been? And that, to me, means a lot um, because I'm probably one of the worst people for saying... I'm okay. I'm okay. But okay isn't actually good enough, really. You know, to live life to the full, you need to, to be more than just okay. And I think the biggest thing I want, and what I hope this type of video will prove, is that people with fibromyalgia, can, they can be from the age of 16 or younger, right up to 80, uh, and in between. <laughs> and to stop and ask people how they are but really mean it and to listen and then maybe ask how you can possibly help because there's sometimes I think to myself oh if only they'd offered to help me with that that would have been great um, and it might only take a few minutes of their time but it would mean a lot to me because what I can't do I have to ask my husband to do uh, and sometimes I think it, it's a lot for him you know he's working full time and then I feel guilty because I'm having to ask for help. And I think most people that have an illness or a condition that they have to live with, they hate asking for help. I, I hate it because I've always been a giver and always been somebody who wants to help others. So for me to then ask for help, I find it really, really hard. Could you give us some examples, maybe shopping? Yeah, sometimes just doing the weekly shop. Now there's just my husband and I at home now. My children have flown the nest. Sometimes that's such a mammoth task for me. If I get up in the morning, I'm aching and I'm tired and my head's thumping and I've got to go and do the shopping. And I find it, I get quite anxious about it and I think, come on, I, I just need to do the shopping. But the way I get around it, I'll sometimes say today, well, actually we only need a few things today. I'll just go to the corner shop. And he doesn't question it. He never says, well, actually it's going to be more expensive if you do it from the corner shop. 
he knows I wouldn't do it if I ha if I could avoid it. I would go and do a big shot, but sometimes I just can't do it. So I I get around it by doing that. Um, other things I might ask him to bring the washing in. I might ask him to do the washing. Um, but I think it's I manage the basic things I have to do at home because I'm one of the lucky ones that can do that. There's others that come to the group and they can't do the basic things. I can manage that, but then I have to think, what else on top of that do I have to do? And that's when it becomes difficult. And that's when I tend, like last night, David cooked the dinner. I was feeling tired. Uh, I was doing the ironing and I thought, I can't do the ironing and the dinner. Uh, there'll be nothing left to give. So he cooked dinner and I suppose we work as a team. And that's when the relationship works well, because he knows I wouldn't ask unless I needed some help. Um, yeah. How does that work? Yeah, I, I do manage to work. Uh, I do a few hours a week. I also do some voluntary work as well. And the voluntary work got me into back into employment because I was doing a job which I found difficult to maintain. And I was working, coming home, going to bed getting up, cooking tea, going to bed. And my husband said, this isn't a quality of life. You're not seeing anybody else. You're not doing anything else. You need to look at your job. And I said, oh, no, I don't want to give my job up. I don't want, but you need to, for your own sanity, you need to. So I did think long and hard about it. It wasn't a job where I could reduce my hours. It wasn't a job where I could go to my employer and say, I can't actually do this role. Can you give me a a different role to do. So I had to give up. And with that came a sense of failure, I suppose, in that I can't do what I wanted to do. Um, and that took me a little while to get out of that. I suppose with that came some depression in that, oh, what, what can I do? I want to contribute to the family. I've always worked. Even when my children were young, I've worked. Uh, what can I do? Um, and I found applying for jobs, the minute you were honest and put down, you have fibromyalgia, the minute you don't hear back from them. I found that a bit difficult because I don't know where they made the assumptions that I wasn't employable, but they obviously felt that I couldn't do the role. Um, and so I, I've done some bank work. I literally get paid for what I do. Uh, it's worked well. Um, I'm hoping it's going to become a more permanent contract. That's my hope, hope that I've proved myself over the last couple of years that I, I am employable, as long as I don't do too many hours. And I think that's what I've understood. I do part, part time. I think that's the best way of explaining it. Um, and it works because I, I, the days I work, I don't do too much before I go to work. And the days I have off, I can enjoy those. Um, yeah, so that's how it works for me. Right. I think that we're here, here really clear is that um, you're looking to live life to the fullest and to do that it's really about um, having to manage your day much more than anyone else would, you know, like really. Hmm. Do you, could you just summarise that? For I me? suppose I'm quite an organised person. <laughs> um, so that maybe has helped. Um, I tend to like to plan things. Um, and... So in order to cope with my day, I do have to cope. I have to look at how I'm going to spend each part of the day. How am I going to spend the morning? How is that going to affect my afternoon? Um, and in days gone by, I would have wanted to fill that day completely. And now I, I can't because I know I've tried it. Believe me, I have tried it <laughs> over the last uh, seven years, eight years, nine years, nine years now, nine years. I've packed tried to pack my days thinking oh I'm having a good spell let's fill that day and then you just pay for it and and I know that when I'm having a bad time I don't want to have too many of those um, so I suppose I'm I don't like to view it as I'm in early retirement but I suppose I I haven't been able to work full-time to the length of time I would have liked to have done um, but not being able to work and having an illness I, I like to look at positives and having this illness m makes me stop and appreciate things around me more so when i was not working and i was trying to build up my 
my stamina and build up my fitness because with fibromyalgia when you have pain it's difficult to exercise because you're in pain and fatigue means if you're doing an exercise class doing an exercise class for an hour is quite difficult it's, it's virtually impossible so I try and build up my walking and swimming and by doing say 10 minutes building it up to 20 minutes and in doing that I've fully appreciated what's around me. I love my family. I'm a grandmother this year and I love my granddaughter to bits and I suppose I've, I've been able to spend more time with them. Um, I enjoy the outdoors so I've been able to appreciate what lovely island we live in. Um, so I suppose there's, yeah, you have to take, try and, try and find a positive out of it I think. Um, I hate it when people get so down that they can't see anything positive and in the support group that's one thing we try to do if you come into the group on a day where we're having a meeting and you're feeling down I just hope that when you leave you feel a, a little bit happier than when you came and if we've achieved that then I think you know, we haven't got all the answers I can't tell people what drugs they should be taking what treatment regime they should be following that's for the GPs that's not for us as a group but if we can listen and let people air their views tell us how they're feeling because sometimes people can't do that at home they may not have anybody at home um, so if they feel that within the group it's confidential we're not going to be telling everybody how they're feeling but it gives them an opportunity to express themselves I've been to the group um, twice now. You meet on a Saturday. We do. Um, 10 a.m. at St Martin's Community Centre. Third Saturday? Uh, it's the last Saturday in the month. Um, we don't meet in August or December. We used to, but we found that numbers were down in those months because people had uh, friends staying, or December you've got the Christmas holidays and everybody is busy. And like I said, with fibromyalgia you need to pace yourself. And me as the group coordinator, I need to do that too. So if I'm not having a good day and I'm trying to run a support group, it's not going to be good. <laughs> so I have to be honest to myself and say, well, actually, I'd rather meet 10 times a year than 12 and give, you know, 99% of me than try and do it every month. Uh, and it seems to work better. So we have a little... Um, little break in the summer and the break at Christmas uh, but I do quite often find in the January support group meeting we have quite a lot of people turn out because maybe they've made it their resolution that New Year that they're going to look after themselves for the next year <laughs> and address what they need to do for them because I think with fibromyalgia you do need to stop and say okay this is my life this is what I have, there are no cures as such, but there are things I can do to help myself and um, with the support group we try to look at what is it that you could do that will make it easier for you and actually make the best of what you have and so yeah I think that's what we try to do and I think maybe that's why January is quite often busy. <laughs> yeah. Can you just tell us when, you, when and where you meet? Okay, yes, it's um, the last Saturday of every month. Uh, it's at the, in the Gerberg room at St. Martin's Community Centre. That's upstairs. There is a lift. Uh, we've been using this uh, facility here for the last uh, seven, no, seven years. Yes, yeah, seven years. Um, and it's, it's ideal. It's a bright room. Uh, the caretakers are really good. They put out all the chairs for us. There's tea and coffee, herbal teas. Um, and it's a, it's a nice friendly atmosphere. People can come for the two hour session, 10 till 12, or they can come for part of it. And we quite often get guest speakers in to come and talk about various things that might be a therapist that might help somebody. Um, people can take away the information and they can try it. So we might have somebody come and speak about yoga, Pilates, laughter therapy, um, mindfulness, we've had various people come and talk to the group. Um, we've got somebody coming in September who's going to be talking about products that she sells that might, people might be interested in. So, but the idea of the group is when you come, 
There is no pressure on you to take part in anything uh, or to buy anything. You can just come and sit and listen. You don't have to talk. Um, if you want to talk, that's fine. Sometimes people come and, and they might be feeling anxious and they might just sit and listen. And then when we have a bit of a break and make a cup of tea, they might think, oh, I, I recognize that person. I'll go and have a chat with them. And if they can bond with even just one person in the group, then that's great. Um, but a lot of people have been coming for quite a long time and they have built up true friendships. Uh, so when they're having a bad day, they might want to be pick the phone up and phone that person, and I think that's good. I think it's nice to be able to do that. We quite often refer to it as, it's an, in, an invisible illness, I'm not going to be able to say that now. Mm -hmm. It's an invisible illness, and people often say, well, you don't look sick. Um, and... Oh, we have it as one of our little slogans, like, I don't know if I've got it out, because the girls put it, put it out for me, and we put it here, like, people with fibromyalgia often look okay on the outside, but are definitely hurting on the inside. It's often referred to as the invis invisible illness, because it's an illness where you do not look sick. Um, so, Joe, tell us a little bit about fibro. Okay, well, it's, it's characterised by having widespread chronic pain, chronic pain amplification, so um, the pain that you have can vary, so it can be mild to very severe, and the fatigue, those are the two main parts of it. But there are, because it's a complex syndrome, there's lots of other parts or symptoms that make up the condition, and those can vary. We, we have a, a leaflet um, to explain it all because it's so complex. So it can be irritable bowel syndrome, um, numbness, weakness, uh, some people get intolerances, so they might be intolerant to extreme cold or extreme heat. Um, poor sleep, a lot of people with fibromyalgia feel that they don't have um, a restful night's sleep, so they go to bed really tired, but when they wake up in the morning they may feel that they haven't slept, or that the sleep they've had has been very disturbed. So we're not going into the deep REM sleep. They may have headaches, chest pain, because it affects muscles, it can affect your organs as well, and your heart is an organ. So they may get chest pain, um, cognitive difficulties, so they may suffer from fibro fog, which is um, a term used for when you're trying to remember something, um, what you've gone upstairs for, uh, somebody's name, um, quite often I'll be in the middle of a conversation and completely forget what I was talking about. Um, uh, you might have sensitivities to light, smells, temperatures, dizziness, um, and anxiety and panic attacks. So um, in days gone by, you might have found it perfectly okay to get on a plane and go and visit relatives in the UK. Um, and for some reason, people with fibromyalgia start getting anxious about things that they wouldn't normally have got anxious about. And that can be quite worrying, quite isolating, because if you feel that you can't do the things that you used to be able to do, then the tendency is then, well, I won't do it, I'll stay home. Um, and with the support group we try to break down that anxiety, try to encourage people to still so, um, socialise, still meet with people. Um, so although it's not life-threatening, it's definitely life-changing for many people and that's why we feel that fibromyalgia isn't, there isn't a lot known about it. It is an invisible illness. You wouldn't know somebody's having severe pain unless they have pain written across their face unless you see them walking stiffly or they look like they're in pain when they're walking so I think it's it's very difficult because there are a lot of other illnesses out there where obviously people are in pain but I think with fibro because there's lots of other parts of the to the condition um, that's what makes it complex and difficult to understand mm -hmm.